Hello, is this line secure? Um, I think so. Who's this? It doesn't matter who I am, for aren't we all stories in the end? Uh, sure. I'm glad that you agree. Is this conspiracy cats? Yeah, yeah, that's me. Mr. Katz, I can assure you we have never spoken before. However, when we last spoke, I have implanted the subconscious four digit code into your brain through subliminal techniques. Please recite that code now. Five, six, eight, three. No, that is my pin number. That's your pin number. How did you get this information? I do not have a pin number. Only hopes and dreams. But you just told me. Please recite the other subliminal code. Seven, three, two, five. Excellent. Excellent. As you know, Simon Dan is the founder and leader of the SEAL Team 6, an elite team of YouTubers tackling the anti-scientific detritus of the web. We have been secretly taking recommendations on who else will be part of this team. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. Sounds like um, an amazing thing to be part of. It is with great pride that we at NASA offer you the second place in the team and as such take the position of second in command. Nah, you're right. <laughs> Only joking. I'd love to do it. I, uh, it, it, was, it was a joke. Mr. Katz, we here at NASA have gone through meticulous surgical procedures to remove all traces of humor. That being said, your joke was hilarious. Oh, oh good. So, will you join? Yeah, yeah, of course. Excellent. Simon Dan will be in contact soon with details regarding your initiation. Please don't call here again. Get in! I need to change my pen number. Again. Will the pain ever go away? One of the things I love most about NASA is the absolutely fantastic photography it sends back from some of its missions. Whether that be Juno, New Horizons, the Mars Rovers, and of course, Cassini. Over the years, they've sent back some beautiful images. So imagine my dismay when I watch this. The Cassini photographic probe was sent out uh, to photograph Saturn and its rings and its moons and send the photos back to Earth. And recently it completed its mission. It sent back amazing pictures of Saturn, of, of the rings of Saturn, crystal clear imagery. And then NASA shared those pictures with the world. But is that actually what happened? And is that actually possible in any way? No. 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 Hello all and welcome to another episode of Flat Earth Friday. If you're new here, my name is Simon Dan and I'll be your host. That clip was from a video by YouTuber Orphan Red, who has some interesting theories as to why the Cassini mission isn't actually real. This video was voted for by my patrons in our monthly poll. If you'd like to get involved in there and check out all the rewards available, I'll leave the link in the description. So, back to the video in question. Let's see what Orphan Red has to say about the Cassini mission. Most people just assume that Cassini sent back Jake peg type images to NASA from Saturn and so that somehow the Cassini was a lot like the camera that I'm using now. Which it was. Cassini's imaging system had two cameras. A wide angle camera that used lenses for large scale scenes such as Saturn itself and a narrow angle camera that used mirrors to focus light for the more intricate shots such as the surface of Saturn's moons. Both of these cameras used a charge coupled device that converts the light into a digital image made of pixels. Each camera also had a variety of filters attached for blocking out certain wavelengths of light. And it was just snapping pictures and sending like an email through the vastness of space, um, JPEG images. And then the NASA scientists were just ooh, opening the email, downloading the image, and there we go, that's Saturn. Except that's not how it works. At all. You're right, that's not how it works. Please continue. How it 
actually worked is that the Cassini took data readings. The Cassini took images of Saturn, but then it transformed it into data that it then beamed through interplanetary space and then through our atmosphere, through the Van Allen um, belts, through the plasma shield that uh, NASA found around our planet several years back, uh, through the atmosphere, through the dust, into the NASA offices. Okay, what's your point? And then they took that information and took some very skilled artists, and the artists used the information that was beamed back from Cassini to create these fantastic images of Saturn and its moons and its rings. So let me get this straight. You think Cassini takes a photo, sends the data from that photo back to NASA, and then some artistic scientist at NASA takes that data and draws an image from it. Well, ha, um, uh, t um, uh, I forget. <laughs> right. Well, that's absolutely not how it works. Yes, Cassini would have taken a photo, and as the light hit the charge couple device, each pixel would have measured the brightness of the light hitting it. The pixels then translate that brightness into a number that is then sent as data back to Earth. So for example, no light at all would have been zero and the brightest white 100. The data is sent via radio waves back to Earth, where a computer at NASA turns that data into an image. It's really not that difficult. Very much like the camera I'm using now, the Cassini is taking a photograph of Saturn, let's say, or Saturn's rings. What's happening is the light from the sun is bouncing off the rings of Saturn and into the Cassini camera and then onto the detector, the light detector sensor and that creates the image in the same way that the camera I'm using now is doing. But here is a crucial factor that's required for an image to be formed in a camera that NASA is curiously not addressing. Oh, here we go, here we go. And none of the scientists, astronomers, astrophysicists, popular media reporting on these things, nobody's talking about this, nobody's brought this up, except for me. And I'm going to keep bringing it up because I think this is something that you cannot ignore. Okay, I'm intrigued. She set this one up well. You can't just say, hmm, I don't really understand how that will work. So I won't think about it. Maybe you should say that exact line to all your flat earth friends. You're a citizen of the world and as a citizen of the world you have a responsibility to make sure that knowledge is valued and truth is the standard by which we separate knowledge from belief. The irony is melting my brain right now. A belief might be true, it might be false. Knowledge, by definition, should be true. And so if NASA is telling us, here's an image of the rings of Saturn taken by the Cassini spacecraft in orbit around Saturn, and that becomes part of the human knowledge, then it should be true. Which it is. Otherwise, we're spreading lies because these images aren't being presented as part of a religious belief system, iconography. It, these images are being presented as truth for not just North American culture, not just Americans, but the world over. And so if they're not true, then, then we have a moral obligation to talk about that. And I have a moral obligation to tell everyone that the earth is not flat and that space is real. So here's the problem. In order for a camera to take a picture, the light has to fall onto the sensors in such a way as to form an image. And in order to do that, it has to be consciously observed. What? It has to be observed by a conscious being. Do you see where the problem lies here? Yes, I do. But it's not with NASA or any of their images. <laughs> if there's no conscious observer observing the light that's falling into the camera and then falling onto the sensor in the camera, then 
the light won't travel as photons, as particles. The light will travel as waves that interfere with each other. And so if you don't have a conscious observer observing the light going into the camera, then on your camera's detector sensors, you'll get an interference pattern. You'll never get an image, a camera out by Saturn trying to take a picture of the light bouncing off the rings of Saturn would not be able to form an image without a conscious observer there to collapse the photon probabilities, the probability wave distribution of photons into particles that can then form an image on the sensors. Without a conscious observer, you have no image. What you have are just interference patterns. Wow, that is one of the most hashed up explanations I've ever seen. If I've understood Orphan Red properly here, she's taking the results of the classic double slit experiment and using those results to explain that the light hitting the camera sensors can't decide if it's gonna be a photon or a wave, and it will be some sort of big mess. This is going along the lines of Schrodinger's cat, or if a tree falls in the woods and there's no one there to hear it, does it make a sound? Well, of course it does. For your particular argument though, I would argue that it doesn't matter. Einstein proves the dual nature of light through quantum mechanics. Essentially, light is made up of particles called photons, and the flow of those photons is a wave. Waves can be of different lengths and frequencies, but a photon is a photon. The only thing that changes is the energy of that photon depending on the wavelength. The charge couple device on a camera is essentially a photon detector, each pixel on it being a well of sorts. The CCD turns those photons into electrons through the photoelectric effect, which is turned into a digital signal. The more photons that hit a pixel, the brighter that pixel in an image. So in conclusion, it doesn't really matter if there's a conscious observer or not. Those photons are still gonna hit the CCD. So there are two possibilities. Possibility number one, NASA is lying to you. Those images are not taken by some spacecraft out in the middle of interplanetary space taking pictures of unwitnessed photon distribution probability waves and then beaming them back through no medium and then through the high-speed electron plasma shielding. I'm sorry, I'm completely lost. The word salad is coming at me at unprecedented speed. So option one is that NASA lies. Let's leave it at that. Probability number two. I think you mean possibility number two, but we'll let that slide. The Cassini spacecraft takes a picture. The photons, unobserved, unwitnessed, are in a superposition state. They're in a probability distribution. So basically the sensor just gets an interference pattern. So there's no image. And then the Cassini spacecraft takes the no image interference pattern data and beams it through interplanetary space, through the Van Allen belt, through the high speed electron plasma shield around the Earth, through the atmosphere, into NASA headquarters. Possibility number two sounds a lot like possibility number one. That would require that the act of the first person at NASA to open the image file that the computer has created from digital data from ones and zeros somehow affects the past that that observation of the image itself goes backwards in time and affects the photon probability distribution wave at the Cassini spacecraft out at Saturn and collapses them into photons in the past. I'm done. I'm sorry. The day has come where I can literally no longer listen to a video. To call it gibberish would be generous. To summarise, there is absolutely nothing in physics to say that these photos cannot be taken. We've been doing it for decades, and to be honest, to doubt it is a true insult to the advancement of our species. 
I implore you to take a look at some of the images taken by the many spacecraft we've sent into the solar system. I'll leave some links in the description. Thank you all for watching. That brings another episode of Flat Earth Friday to a close. I've been Simon Dan, and if you enjoyed this, please, please do like and subscribe. I'll see you all Tuesday where we're going back after the dinosaur doubters. What happens when you mix a woeful understanding of our natural world with a Macedonian chat show? Because they're destroying it because, oh, it's just an accidental planet, one of millions. We've found other Earths, you know. Eventually, if this one gets too messed up, we'll go to another one. You get Allegedly Dave on Late Night with Malenko. Welcome one and all to another edition of the well-loved and ever-popular Flat Earth Friday. My name is Simon Dan and I am delighted that you can join me. Today we delve into the mind of Allegedly Dave, or D. Murphy 25 if you want to use his official name. He has spent some considerable time looking at alternative lifestyles, including this. Hello. So... Day one of the uh, Great Breatharian Experiment. Surprisingly, for somebody who's uh, done a 30-day fast and forgotten to eat for eight or nine days, I found the first day to be very, actually, very difficult, actually. And even this. Well, I've been drinking urine now for, for six years. Oh, maybe someone should tell him that urine is 96% water, and it's probably better if he just drunk water. So when I saw that he had appeared on a chat show in the country of Macedonia, how the hell did that transpire by the way, I was intrigued. So I'm going to sit here with a nice coffee and see what he's got to say. You know, put an end to this topic once and for all, turn the Hubble round and show us um, Earth in real time, zooming in onto a, a place so that we can see what's happening at that place and, and we know that there is something up there looking down on us um, um, from space. But they will not do it. They can't do it. It, 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 can't, it doesn't exist. It literally doesn't exist. <coughs> um, sorry to disappoint you, Dave, um, but it does. Here, look. This is a picture from the Japanese Himawari satellite taken on November the 16th at 4.40 a.m. UTC. And this is a picture from NASA's EPIC satellite taken at almost exactly the same time on the exact same date. But let me guess, they're both fake, right? Well, let's take a closer look. Even though these photos were taken from a slightly different angle, you can clearly see that the cloud formations are identical. So either the Japanese Space Agency and NASA have the same animators, which by the way, have the unbelievable ability to even make sure that the Earth is illuminated properly by the sun on each image, or they are both real images. Now, what's more likely? It's, it's all fraud, it's all fake. Um, pretty much everything NASA puts out is, is fraudulent. I hope you're not including the infrared ear thermometer in that list. Or prosthetics, or ventricular assist devices, or landmine removal tools, or firefighting equipment, or temper foam, or enriched baby formula, or water purification. I could go on. My point is, your blind mistrust for NASA means you don't appreciate the other things they've had a hand in creating. Um, nobody has actually um, really gone all the way across Antarctica. Yeah? Now, there are millionaires out there who, who could you know, assemble the resources to make an expedition and completely you know, go across and chart Antarctica and make a name for themselves, being the first person to do that. Yeah? But nobody ever does. Um, I'm going to get serious now because this is one of the things that sickens me most about flat earthers. This man is Henry Worsley. He wanted to become the first person to ever cross Antarctica completely unassisted and unsupported. He was a seasoned explorer and before the trip raised £100,000 for injured servicemen and women. On the 24th of January 2016 he died just 30 miles short of making it. So when you throw away a statement like this um, nobody has actually um, really gone all the way across Antarctica. Do you think that Henry's friends, family and colleagues appreciate that? 
Do you think his wife and children want to be told that he died doing something that you believe is just a story? You don't have the right to clean the boots he used to make the trip, let alone comment on its believability. Let's just leave that as the disgraceful, offensive comment that it is. You should be ashamed. If a pilot is, uh, is flying around the curve of the earth, then it sh he should be dipping the nose down um, every, every five minutes. He should be dipping the nose down to, to stay around the curve. We don't live on a ball 10 miles across, Dave. But the thing that really um, uh, got me interested was... Wanted to feel inferior to the majority of the human race? As you say, the gyroscope. Oh, OK, right. In, in a plane, there is a, an, an artificial horizon, OK, and it's based on a gyroscope. And if you spin a gyroscope um, on a surface, it will want to stay upright. You can twist and tilt the surface as much as you like. The gyroscope will stay upright. So if a plane has a gyroscope and it starts um, following the curve of the Earth, mm. the gyroscope would stay upright, which mm. means your, the uh, um, artificial horizon will start to, to roll backwards. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't. Mm -hmm. That's absolute proof that a plane flies over a flat surface. Dave. Dave, Dave, Dave. The Earth is big. It has a circumference of just over 40,000 kilometers. But besides all that, let's look at those gyros for a second. I once again turn to my pilot friend James, who helped me out a great deal here. Attitude instruments in airliners now are far more accurate than they used to be, and derive information from a large amount of air data sources. Some light aircraft still do use the gyro instrument for attitude indication that Dave is describing here. However, they have a weight at the bottom, which means that they always have a force pulling directly down below the aircraft to give them a fixed horizon reference. That wouldn't be affected by the curvature of the Earth, as gravity always pulls in the same direction, regardless of where you are around the curve. Thanks for that, James. We'll get together soon and watch some partridge. Jurassic Park. As you say, the, the globe is, is spinning at a thousand miles an hour. Um, Neil deGrasse Tyson, who's um, a leading astronomer in America, tells us that, that the Earth is not a perfect circle, it is actually an oblate spheroid, it's squashed. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and wider at the equator, yeah? Mm -hmm. So, um... Znači, po, po stesnet je na polovite, a po širok je na ekvatorot. Exactly. I really hope he's got an earpiece in getting the translation for that, otherwise that's golden cringe. Um, so my question to him would be, why is there land at the equator? Say what now? Because, um... Water will move more readily than rock. So if the Earth is spinning, the water will be um, collected at the equator. I mean, if you spin a wet um, tennis ball, okay, you spin a wet tennis ball, the water shoots off mm -hmm. at the equator, essentially. So all the water will be um, gathered around the equator. So why is there land at the equator? Doesn't make any sense. Oh, Dave. Right, let's examine this claim. The centrifugal force acting on me right now because of the Earth's rotation is figured out as follows. Mass times velocity squared over radius. So my mass is 70 kilograms and the speed of Earth's rotation is 463.6 meters per second. If we square that and multiply it by my mass, then divide that by the radius of Earth in meters, we get a force of 2.36 newtons. Now. The gravitational force exerted on me is my mass of 70 kilograms multiplied by the Earth's mass of 5.972 times 10 to the power of 24 kilograms multiplied by the gravitational constant of 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 and then we divide all of that by the radius of Earth squared and we get 687 newtons. Hmm, 687 is a lot more than 2.36, isn't it? Interesting. So as you can see, the gravitational force is hundreds of times stronger than the central fugal force caused by the Earth's rotation. Uh, it's why you can spin a tennis ball and the water will fly off, because if you do the calculations, at that point the central fugal force is greater than the gravitational force. If you watch the trajectory of the space shuttle, it doesn't go straight up, it always goes in a curve 
um, and out to sea. Yeah, and if you see it, why is that? Well, because it that, is it normal to go straight up well, as fast as he can to go out of the of well, the atmosphere. Um, I, you know, I, again, I'm, I've been talking to a few people um, in in sort of the scientific community, and they'll say, no, straight up isn't the right way to go. You have to sort of go sort of around the curve and 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 get speed mm. to to get into orbit. Space isn't that far away, Dave. The objective of the Space Shuttle was to get in orbit as quickly as possible and use the least amount of fuel as possible. Going straight up and then doing a 90 degree turn is not the best way to do it. I mean, you wouldn't join a motorway at 70 miles an hour from a T-junction. No, you wouldn't. You would join from a slip road that angles you gently onto the motorway. And it seems that uh, nobody's ever on the Space Shuttle. And the proof of that is the Challenger disaster. Um, in, uh, I believe it's 1986, the Challenger exploded just after takeoff and killed seven astronauts. But it turns out that six of the astronauts are still alive and uh, most of them are using their original names. Um, and, you, you know, uh, you can find pictures of them. They're, they're using the same names and they're, they're doing ordinary jobs now. Anyone who's watched me for some time will know that I've addressed this before on an older video when Sleeping Warrior made the same disrespectful comments. Here's a quick clip. What he's probably seen is a picture like this or a slightly different variation of it or a YouTube video or something. Now if Mr Warrior had actually looked into it and done some research, not flat earth research but proper research, he would have found out that this is all a hoax. The man on the left of this picture is the commander of Challenger, Francis Scobie. The man on the right is also Francis Scobie, who during the time of the launch was CEO and president of the Marketing Edge Inc. out of Chicago. Clearly not the same guy. I mean, they've got completely different shaped chins. What about this one? The man on the left of this picture is Challenger Mission Specialist Ellison Onizaka. The man on the right is his brother Claude. And this one. The lady on the left of this picture is Sharon McAuliffe, a teacher who was selected out of 11,000 applicants to be the first civilian in space. The lady on the right doesn't even look like her, and we're supposed to believe that they're the same person, despite the fact that at the time of the launch, Sharon McAuliffe on the right was working for a law, a law firm in New York. That's just three examples, and it's the same for all the others. A horrible hoax that is a disgrace to the memory of the astronauts that lost their lives that day. That's twice in 10 minutes now, Dave, that you've shit all over the memory of brave, courageous people that have lost their lives in pursuit of greatness. Believing that the Earth is flat is one thing, and rest assured, Dave, it is a silly belief. But to willfully display such a high level of ignorance and disrespect is the lowest of the low. Shame on you again. That brings this episode to a close in a disappointing and sombre fashion. I do struggle to find the right words when flat earthers move from mere speculation to this sort of thing. So we'll call it a day here and leave Dave to his half pint of urine. My morning routine is basically, um, I would you know, get up, um, wear my glass, um, drink most of it, uh, leaving a little bit at the bottom. And uh, yeah, I'd wash myself with it. Thank you all for joining me for another episode of Flat Earth Friday. I have been Simon Dan. If you enjoyed watching, please do like and subscribe. I'll see you all Tuesday where we look at a possible ninth planet. See you. Hello, um, this is Chimichangas, right? Yeah, um, I'd like to book a table, please, for two. Yeah, I'll hold. Man, Conspiracy Cats is gonna be stoked about this. Yes, um, for next Wednesday, please. Um, about 7.30? Name? El Nombre. El Nombre.
Some people really don't have anything better to do with their time, do they? I'll post a link in the description of the El Nombre video, kindly put together by a Mr. Chesik, in what I can only assume was a feeble attempt at trying to get to me. Anyway, today we ask the age old question, who would want to live on Earth when you can live on a super Earth? Hello one and all, and thank you for joining me for another episode of Flat Earth Friday. My name's Simon Dan, and I'll be your host. Yes, that was channel Celebrate Truth, run by YouTuber Robbie Davidson. He's the brains behind the Flat Earth International Conference, as well as the introduction of Logan Paul to the Flat Earth community. Seems odd, that one. In today's video, Celebrate Truth are reviewing a scientific video about the discovery of exoplanets. These are planets which we have discovered outside of our own solar system. To date, we've discovered over 3,000 of them. Oh, that, that reminds me, this gives me a chance to test the YouTube channel of Truth Paradox. Uh, let's have a quick reminder about what that is. I've invented something. It's called the YouTube channel of Truth Paradox. It states without exception that if a channel has the word truth in its name, then you can guarantee that the contents of said channel is a load of old cobblers. We'll reserve our judgment till the end today. Of course, alien life. Now we're getting to the propaganda, getting off of Earth and getting to these super Earths. Look at all the possibilities. I can sense a very thin veil of sarcasm in his delivery. He's approaching this video with an already formed negative opinion of it. I mean, who does that? Or you know, plenty of places we could park our first interstellar colonies. But with so many options, how do we know which is best? You might think that most Earth-like planets should be at the top of our list. After all, we've got everything we need, water, land, an atmosphere, and trillions of life forms lapping it all up. But according to a small group of researchers, there are bigger and better planets out there. Oh, there's bigger and better planets out there. Now, first of all, the Earth is not a planet. One of the biggest lies. Oh, bloody hell, less than a minute in and he's confirmed the paradox. Oh, well, he did better than the last Truth Channel, to be fair. If you come to this video for the first time, please research it. The whole idea that we're just another planet and billions and trillions of other planets. It's just nothing but to make you insignificant, no value, you're just a speck of dust in the infinite galaxy. Well, you're actually both wrong and right here. We are but a speck of dust in an almost infinite universe. The universe doesn't really care about us. In fact, it tries to kill us 99.9999999999% of the time. However, it doesn't mean we're all insignificant, and we certainly do all have value, including you flat earthers. But again, this is where the rhetoric gets actually even more interesting when they put videos like this together and talking about super earths, better places to live than what we're on. This desperate notion that we need to get off. We're human. We just want to explore. That's all. There's no hidden agenda to try and make us move planets. We just want to explore and find out more about the universe. Let's continue. They're called super earths. Super Earths may be some of the most common planets in our galaxy. Since 2009, the Kepler Space Telescope has discovered about 4,000 exoplanets. 30% of them are Super Earths. So out of all the exoplanets, 30% of them are Super Earths. Now understand that the Super Earths are way better than even Earth. I think you're misunderstanding the term Super Earth. It just means a large Earth-type planet which is bigger than Earth. It doesn't mean better than Earth in every way. It's not an Earth-type planet with a cape on that can shoot lasers from its poles. Okay, let's, let's forget about the fact that they're lying about space and planets. Just understand this idea that almost everything, 30% of everything that they've discovered out there is better. It's better to be habitable, better for life, better for conditions, better for atmosphere. Yeah, he's definitely misunderstood that, hasn't he? That's not like a flat earther, is it? As we'll continue on with this video, you're gonna see nonstop propaganda when it comes to super earths. Who would wanna live on earth when you can live on a super earth? And a few percent of those super earths orbit within their host stars habitable zone. 
That's the Goldilocks zone where the planet's surface is just the right temperature for liquid water. The Goldilocks zone. Yeah, Goldilocks zone. Please tell me you've read Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Don't make me educate you on fairy tales too. Liquid water is just the start. These planets can be almost double Earth's radius and up to 10 times more massive. And all that extra mass is what researchers think could really make super-Earths the perfect home. That's because more massive planets have a stronger gravitational pull. Super-Earth Kepler-20b, for example, is nearly double the size of Earth, and it's 10 times more massive. This makes its surface gravity almost three times stronger. That stronger gravity means that the planet can hold on to more air molecules and form a thicker atmosphere, which is great for protecting against harmful space radiation. You know, that radiation, the Van Allen radiation belts that they supposedly went through in the moon landings in the 1960s and 70s that Orion is still trying to figure out with their shielding, saying we got a major problem because we got lots of this radiation. Again, nonstop lies. Why? Why, 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 why? If space was fake and NASA completely made up, why would they say this is an issue? Why not just say space is real and it's not an issue to get there? I'll tell you why, Robbie. Because space is real and it's bloody hard to get there and twice as hard to come back safely as well. Let's continue. It also means mountains and hills would erode a lot faster, leaving a relatively flatter surface compared to Earth. Oh no. Now that might sound boring, but scientists think this could actually spawn dozens of shallow islands all across the planet. So let me go to straight. A flatter Earth is better for life. It's better designed. It's very interesting that they would point this out, saying that these super Earths probably are going to be flatter and it will be better for life because apparently flatter is better. Oh, hang on. All of a sudden the video he's watching is right. It's not propaganda anymore because there's a 15 second segment that he agrees with. But I bet it'll be propaganda again in a minute when he doesn't agree with it. The hypocrisy is unrivaled. Leaving this tropical paradise would be extremely difficult. The escape velocity on Kepler-20b is more than double compared to Earth's. Which means either rockets would need more fuel to reach their destinations. Like, for example, a mission similar to the Apollo moon landing would require twice the amount of fuel or rockets would have to carry only a fraction of the payload. For instance, SpaceX's Falcon Heavy. The big fake that sent out uh, a car into space that everyone believed was real. Oh yeah, that one? Yeah, that one. Clearly not fake, by the way. Can launch 50,000 kilograms of payload into Earth's orbit. Whereas it could only launch 40 kilograms into orbit around a super Earth like Kepler-20b. That's about the weight of a German Shepherd. Suffice it to say, leaving a super-Earth would be a far greater challenge. So here they go with more propaganda. Obviously, they're trying to get off, but they're saying it's going to be difficult because of the atmosphere, because of gravity, because of all these equations that they put together. Equations that you clearly don't understand. It's another example of, I don't understand this, so it must be wrong. Otherwise known as the Dunning-Kruger effect. Yes, Robbie, it's rife in the Flat Earth community. But again, you get to see where their agenda lies. This is kind of the place, obviously, in a galaxy that was created out of nothing, that was random. There would be billions of other better choices that we probably wouldn't be the only one. Again, this goes in complete opposition to the Word of God, to the Bible stating that the Earth was created unique and special, and it was perfect in all of its ways for life. God created it. Again, it wasn't created by an accident, by a big bang, created out of nothing. But again, this is what the entire scientism narrative is all about, is reducing us to evolved from the slime. And there is his agenda. He's too scared to admit that he's part of a race that is essentially alone in the universe. I know it's hard, but I subscribe to the same words as Richard Feynman, who said, I don't feel frightened by not knowing things by being lost in the mysterious universe without having any purpose, which is the way it really is, as far as I can tell, possibly. It doesn't frighten me. What a lovely note to end that video on today. Celebrate Truth rambles on for another 10 minutes or so. 
about propaganda and stuff like that. It's all just nonsense. Thank you very much for watching today. Thank you to all the subscribers, the new ones for finding me and the old ones for sticking with me. I have been Simon Dan. Please do like and subscribe. This has been Flat Earth Friday and I'll see you all on Tuesday where we'll take a look at those ISS fails. Hello one and all and welcome to Flat Earth Friday with me, Simon Dan. Yes, today sees the return of the ever popular Flat Earth Fail compilation, episode 4 to be precise. In these particular videos, I get 3 or 4 videos made by Flat Earthers and lump them all together into bite-sized chunks of scientific failure. Special thanks goes out to my patrons on this one. We had a hangout and some of them helped me choose some of the videos we're going to look at today. If you'd like to get involved in the Patreon stuff, I'll leave a link in the description. Okay, back to today's video. The first one is by Flat Max UK, who's got it in his head that the solstice and seasons prove a close sun. Let's hear him out. Right, I'm fairly happy with that so far. Looking very good, he's even using a diagram. Is actually quite a good video. Why did I pick it? Seriously, we may have to stop this one. Nothing to debunk so far. Okay, so Max is saying there are 3,000 miles or so between the two points, okay? Our survey said... No, 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 no. The heliocentric model, let's call that real life, does not attribute that to the change in temperature or seasons. Nowhere does it ever say that? Max, Max, you are comparing the difference in temperatures of seasons on a planet orbiting the sun between 147 and 152 million kilometers to the difference in temperature of your hand next to a cup of tea from pretty much zero to what, 10 centimeters? That is literally the worst comparison I've ever seen. And I've seen a lot.
Oh, come on. So what does that tell you about the theory that being close to the sun is the main reason why the temperature change happens? It tells you it's a load of old cod's wallop. Yes, Max, because the reason for that temperature change is not the distance. It's the angle at which the sun's radiation hits the Earth. Here in the UK, in midsummer, the sun is at 62 degrees. In winter, it's only 16 degrees. More radiation per square kilometre. Simple as that. Let's move on to our next failure. This one is from YouTuber Lord Stephen Christ Mercury, who has some interesting ideas. Hello, people. Steve, a.k.a. Bob Ross, Christ here. I'm just going to tell you a little information about the concavity, concavity of the oit. Concavity of the earth, okay? As I mentioned before in my previous videos, you are living on the inside surface. So these are like continents, you know? Put some continents over here. Maybe this is like North America or... And then you got ocean, ocean, it's on the inside of the earth, guys. Yes, Stephen is a concave earther. Not flat earth specific, but still a fail nonetheless. Let's carry on and see where his interesting ideas lead us. Continents and oceans on the inside, wow. That's how tides work, it's all pressure. So this relieves the pressure, this is the sun. The sun actually has a back flex, flat side, believe it or not. The back of the sun is flat and dark. I've seen it in a vision. I know what I'm talking about, okay? Oh, he's seen it in a vision. Right. In the earth, okay? Well, let's put the glass sky. Gotta put the glass sky. There's a glass sky. I kid you not. There is a glass sky. The come on line. Come on. Come on. 100 kilometers high, formed after the flood. This is the celestial sphere. There is actually water above. Then in the middle, of course, you got the Pyramida. Pyramida. Pyramid. This is the apex, the father of lights. So hang on. There's a load of glass 100 kilometers up, then more water, then a giant pyramid. Right. Remember James 1, 17? Father of lights. Father of lights extends its light to the sun. Sun is wrapping around in a cylindrical path. This is from a top view, so actually it was, a, it was if the sun was here on like a side view, it would be going cylindrically. That's how you get the season, guys. Six months here, six months there. Back, back and forth, up and down. Celestial sphere tilts. That's how we get the procession. There's a magnetic north pole stemming from the vertical magnetic shaft of the pyramid. That's why it moves. That's why the magno magnetic north pole moves. Because the whole celestial sphere is slowly wobbling over 1,000 years, not 26,000. So why doesn't the North Star position change in a 1,000 year cycle then? I'm already done with this. No evidence, visions, and a drawing. Next. 
Hello, Flat Earth researchers, debaters and debunkers. Oh no, not Phuket word again. Can't get rid of this guy. Here's a little thought experiment and some real physics to just think about what we are told to believe when it comes to the globe Earth. There's the sun, okay, and uh, we are told that uh, the Earth rotates to make the sun set. So I've got the I've got a little table here, all right, and there's a there's a can here. Um, so what happens? when the earth uh, tilts so that we see a sunset. Oh dear. Oh dear indeed. This has to be one of the most feeble, unorganized and downright deceitful experiments I've ever seen. However, I am intrigued. So let's see more. Oh dear. Oh, and oh there's the sunrise because the earth is coming back round again. Yeah. <laughs> is he trolling? He has to be trolling, right? Seem crazy? Seem stupid? Yeah? Just think about it. Just think about what happens the moment something tilts. Yeah? Okay? It's physically impossible for us to be on a spinning ball Earth. It's physically impossible to represent the Earth as a table and then tilt that table to simulate a sunrise and a sunset. And then think that that's a good analogy for it. Physically impossible. There must be another reason for this. So forget about all those arguments about horizons and alleged drop and air pressure and gradients and Coriolis and atmosphere sticking to the earth and all that stuff and angles and blah blah blah. Yeah, the simple fact is that things like the physics of water which must be contained and if it is tilted will, will demonstrate that tilt if it's not contained, it will flow. And if it's on a moving earth, then it will, <laughs> it will also move. Yeah, this is real physics, folks. Yeah. Oh. I've got it. He's working for the globe side, trying to discredit flat earthers. Has to be, no other explanation. Right, our final video sees us popping in on YouTuber Lifting the Lid, who has a video entitled Flat Earth Challenge for All Scientists. Let's see where this goes.
oh, oh, I want to be on that Hall of Shame. I'll apply and let all you guys know how I get on. Well, that about wraps it up for another Flat Earth Friday. Thank you all for watching. Before we finish, I've just got time to mention a fabulous recent interview conducted by channel Fight the Flat Earth, who conducted an interview with a former Flat Earther. It's a very, very good insight. You should take a look. I'll leave a link in the description. My name has been Simon Dan. Please, please do leave a like and subscribe if you enjoyed it. Even hit the bell if you want to. And I'll see you all on Tuesday, where we'll finally be looking at chemtrails. When Enjoy. I get random requests to do a video, there is a YouTuber that gets mentioned a lot. Kepler's second law destroyed by the moon. The moon isn't a planetary body. The moon is its own light. Yes, that was Mr. Thrive and Survive, who today seems to have found evidence that the moon is not a planetary body. This is Flat Earth Friday. My name is Simon Dan. Let's get started. Welcome along everyone as we delve into the psyche of the opinionated, paranoid and uneducated elite for more Flat Earth Friday madness. Yes, today we look at a video by Mr. Thrive and Survive entitled The Moon Destroys Kepler's Second Law. He's endorsing a video by a Dave Marsh who was a long time troll on my Facebook page. Both of these men are hardcore Flat Earthers. Before we begin, I think it would be appropriate just to make sure that we all understand Kepler's Second Law. It states, an imaginary line joining a planet and the sun sweeps out an equal area of space in equal amounts of time. Now, of course, this means the closer your orbit approaches the sun, the faster you will go. Take a look at this animation. If we take the points on the orbit indicated as equal segments of time along that orbit, then the areas swept out between each points are the same. This is established planetary physics. Right, let's see Mr. Thrive and Survive and Dave this prove 400 year old science. Hey everybody, Christmas for Thrive and Survive. September 13th, 2018, I'm once again referencing a video here today which will be linked below uh, by uh, David Marsh. Dave Marsh is a guy that disproved gravity in an old video of mine. And um, I'm not gonna play all of his video, I'm gonna play a portion of this video that applies to this. Uh, please go and see uh, the link below for all the details. Uh, we're gonna show here, or he showed, uh, and backed up with actual timeanddate.com and other websites that his data matched their data and that data indicates that Kepler's second law of planetary motion is destroyed. So to clarify, Dave Marsh spent a year tracking the moon and got the exact same data he would have got from timeanddate.com. Perhaps he got the idea from howtowasteayear.org. And the conclusion is that either the moon isn't a planetary body or Kepler's second law is just bunk, or both. Sure, a regular guy from the UK with no scientific background whatsoever has disproved gravity, and now he's ruined Kepler's laws and debunked the moon. And then Mr. Thrive and Survive comes along and thinks he can all explain it all whilst having the intellectual capacity of an empty Marmite jar. Uh, I don't know what else to say. You're going to see the evidence in this video, and uh, it's only going to be probably about 10 or 15 minute video here. Uh, what you're looking at here is, let's go to this little diagram first. In fact, let me make it larger. See if I can move the other one out of the way. There we go. Uh, what we have here is that whatever the body is, we're going to switch this here because it works the same way, uh, the Earth and the Moon. Uh, when the body is... Uh, farthest away or apogee uh, away from the object the the main gravitational thing the orbiting thing here and this has been supposedly verified with Jupiter's moons observations and maybe that's how Kepler came up with it I don't know you can look up the history Kepler was a masterful mathematician he figured out his laws with nothing but observation and maths the observations he used were highly accurate and the story of it all is for another video but it was proven the moment he figured it out because he used real world observations. It is important to note though, that you can't have Kepler's second law without his first. And that is that all planetary bodies travel in ellipses. There are no perfectly circular orbits. The closest is Venus, which has an eccentricity of 0.007, meaning its orbit is the closest to a perfect circle in the solar system. I shall be live streaming a lecture on the history of astronomy early next month. But this blue shaded area indicates how 
slow the planet is moving or how much it has moved. And let's say this is a like one week period of time. Since when it goes around in orbit, it goes slower at its furthest away. And when it comes back in the same one week period, it's moving all this much. So it's moving much faster as it gets closer. At least Mr. Thrive and Survive has a grasp on the law. Please bear in mind though, that the eccentricity of the orbit in his example is highly exaggerated. Now let's look at the other. This is the same thing. You can pause this if you like and take a look at it. I'll leave it here for a couple seconds, but it's just another way of showing the exact same thing. It's and here it is with the Earth actually in the center. Same thing. You have apogee over here and perigee over here. Uh, interesting too is uh, the moon is supposed to be so much bigger in the sky at perigee. And uh, another part of David's video, he also shows that it's much smaller at this time. Hmm, interesting. Let's see what this research is then. See, the moon just doesn't follow the heliocentric model. Now in his video, he does what he calls a moon race. And he filmed the moon when it was over the equator, when it was over the Tropic of Capricorn, and when it was over the Tropic of Cancer. And, well, I'll let it play, and then you can see for yourself how this moon race, and what he discovered, absolutely destroys Kepler's second law of planetary motion. The moon on the equator took five, five minutes and 20 seconds to cross my screen. On the Tropic of Capricorn, it took five minutes, 36. But on the Tropic of Cancer, it seems to take forever. It took six minutes, 15 seconds to cross my screen. Look at the time difference there. That's huge. Dave, the fundamental problem you had when you were conducting this moon race is that you weren't conducting the speed of the moon in its orbit. You were tracking the Earth's rotational speed. This is an absolute classic example of a complete misunderstanding of how things actually work. Your bias, Dave, of a flat, motionless Earth means you have completely and utterly wrecked yourself. If you really wanted to track the orbital velocity of the moon, you would have had to track its motion against the stars on, in the background over the course of a night. It's, it's, it's soul destroying. If, I, if I'd have had to wait for the sun to get in that position, I'd, I'd have had to wait quite a long time to, <laughs> to get in that exact same position. So uh, as you can see on, on August the 5th, my reading, the moon took 24 hours and 49 minutes for the meridian passing time on that night for the moon to occupy the same spot. Then when the moon was on the equator, the moon took 24 hours, 48 minutes. So it's speeding up when it's heading towards perigee. Remember, it speeded up when it was heading towards apogee. It can't speed up both directions. It's impossible. Dear, oh dear. Perhaps because you are measuring the Earth's rotation, Dave? Maybe? According to Kepler's law of planetary motion and its equal uh, area and equal time law, the moon should spend the first half of its cycle speeding up with just a change in speed of around about 6%, and uh, the same when it, when it going back the opposite direction. It should never speed up going to and from Apogee. That, that completely destroys Kepler's law. This has to be one of the most epic fails I've ever seen, confusing the moon's orbital speed with Earth's rotation, and then destroying Kepler's second law with the data. It, it, it shouldn't do that. It's impossible. And... You're probably thinking, yeah, but you could just put any uh, any of them readings on the screen yourself. You know what I mean? I've, I've had to type them in there. Let's give you a confirmation first. So when the moon was on the Tropic of Capricorn, it took 5 minutes and 36 seconds to cross my screen. And the meridian passing on that night was 24 hours and 49 minutes. When the moon was on the equator, it took less time so it was speeding up and it took five minutes 20 seconds and the meridian passing on that night was 24 hours 48 minutes it's matching up exactly what i'm shooting in reality and you know the moon took a long time to cross my screen it took six minutes 15 seconds well look at the meridian passing time on that night 24 hours and 57 minutes it's matching up exactly what i'm do what i'm shooting in reality globe earth confirmed Although it speeds up in the globe model from a globe Earth perspective, it should appear to slow down. So how can it speed up? Yes, that's the real question. How can it speed up at both ends of the spectrum there? Kepler's second law destroyed by the moon. The moon isn't a planetary body. The moon is its own light. And Thrive and Survive swallows it like Pie Man Dan at a pie-eating contest. 
Ranty has got some real competition for Globe Earth Proof. Dave Marsh has entered the arena. I'll link David's full video below where you can see the evidence for yourself. What a waste of a year. You might as well spend the time counting the hairs on your testicle. Right, that about wraps up another Flat Earth Friday. Two more Flat Earthers sent packing. If you enjoyed that, please, please do like and subscribe. If you really enjoyed it, you can tap the little bell notification too. I have been Simon Dan, thank you all for watching, and I'll see you all Tuesday where we investigate the individuals that say they've traveled through time. Greetings, Mr. Soundly. My name is not important. What is important is you. You, sir, have been selected, nay, picked, picked out of millions and millions to join Simon Dan's SEAL Team 6. SEAL stands for science, education, and logic. SEAL Team 6 is an elite group of people dedicated to eradicate ignorance and stupidity. It's a daunting task, we know, but that is why we have the best man on the job. Our team leader, Simon Dan. Our first officer, Conspiracy Cats. And now you, Mr. Soundly. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to educate the willing and the open-minded to the wonders of this world. We cannot stress enough how important it is for the people to know that the Earth is not a cube and Antarctica is not Madonna's new album. The people need you, Mr. Soundly. We need you. You have 72 hours to reply and let us know if you accept to join Simon Dan's team. SEAL Team 6 is waiting. This email has been sent from my Galaxy Note 9. A man can dream. Way back in January last year, I made my first ever video. Take a look at this. I thought I'd start with something that's been getting a lot of traction recently, flat earthers. So I came across this flat earth guy on YouTube called D Marble. He could be well known, I'm not sure, but I also don't care. Oof, so village. Yes, I decided to take D Marble on in my first ever video. Back then I used to tell the video makers that a response was coming. This was his comment when I told him that very thing. That arrogance has stayed with me ever since, and the fact that I had zero subscribers when I released that video was probably laughable to him. But guess what? Almost a year later, D Marble will yet again be a subject of my video. Let's see how he likes this one now that I've got twice the amount of subscribers that he has. Welcome everyone to the final Flat Earth Friday of 2018. My name is Simon Dan. I hope you had a lovely, enjoyable and restful Christmas. D Marble is someone I've always looked at and thought this man has no grasp whatsoever of any scientific understanding. So when I watched one of his recent videos on NASA, I simply had to comment. The video starts whilst he's watching one of NASA's live feeds. You know what, I was just about to make a video uh, about the ISS and then I come over to NASA's channel on YouTube and I get this message. First one I got here, it was just a complete black screen, like there was no connection. Oh wait, look, looks like something's happening. There's that black screen again. Did they, did they fix it? What happened? Let me refresh. Just dis disabled for this live stream, still got the black screen. Exhilarating stuff, isn't it? All right, so anybody wanting to watch NASA live feed from the ISS right now, um, yeah, you get nothing. Hope everybody's enjoying this. Yes, it's positively thrilling. There's uh, $52 million a day at work right here. Absolutely nothing. Yes, because they pump all of that money into their live ISS camera feed, don't they? I'm going to pop a little link in the description of the 2018 NASA budget. Have a little read of that when you get a chance, and it might give you a better idea of where all that money goes. Uh, said they may have lost connection to the satellites, or, um... 
yeah, I'm just wondering exactly how NASA has no connectivity. I mean, aren't there like thousands of satellites orbiting Earth around the same altitude that the ISS is supposed to be traveling while orbiting the Earth? How exactly do they go about losing signal when all those satellites are up there bounce uh, signals? But it doesn't make any sense. The ISS communicates with NASA through a mixture of geostationary satellites and ground-based stations. However, there are sometimes slight gaps in transmissions due to line-of-sight constraints. The ISS is travelling much faster than these satellites and also is much closer to Earth. The ISS has an orbital height of around 400 kilometers, the geostationary satellites around 35,000 kilometers. You know what, I think I'll just go ahead and use uh, some other video. Okay, so now we have something on the screen. What like what was this supposed to be? Went from the black screen, went to the alert that there was a loss of connection, and now we're just looking off into the blackness of space, I suppose. Okay. Get it. Freaking get it together, NASA. What is this? Well, like, what are we even looking at right now? If I had to guess, I'd say it's a view from one of the nodes looking out into space. Is this supposed to be live? So what I wanted to do was show you, uh, anyway, regardless of these issues that NASA's having, uh, something that I thought was pretty cool. Uh, the hurricane that was out, uh, you know, a few weeks back, NASA put out a uh, picture of this... Um, <laughs> of the storm from the ISS, apparently, and uh, what people started doing immediately was looking at the curvature um, that was presented by NASA and then comparing that to the globe. So I just wanted to show you this, uh, how, how I do that, just as an example. Now, I was wanting to get some ISS footage um, from NASA on YouTube, but I had to uh, find this video on Facebook, and I had actually posted this. Uh, it looks pretty ridiculous. Why does it look ridiculous? It's an astronaut doing a spacewalk. That's amazing. From the ISS. Um, the volume's turned down, so you, you know, don't have the audible sounds. And actually, this is a video that I had talked about a little bit on another uh, video a while back and uh, there was a point where, let me see, let's bring it back just a sec. Now hold on, you're gonna see in just a minute how there's this little mirror on his on his wrist. I believe it's right here, hold on. Wait, right there. Bring it back, a few seconds. Bring it here and mm. All right, so he's supposed to be above Earth, and yet this mirror on his wrist is reflecting upwards, and you see a curve there, you see more Earth. I mean, it's obvious, obvious trickery here. Obvious trickery. That wrist mirror is used by astronauts to read things that they cannot see because they're in the suit. That reflection is real. A lot of people would have missed that, but... Yeah, that's a red flag in itself, but we'll continue on to uh, view this footage. This is the showing uh, usage of a fisheye lens back there, whatever the situation is. It does look like a fisheye lens, but so what if it is? Firstly, the astronauts don't wear these cameras to prove to the 26 flat earthers of this world that it's a globe. And secondly, if that's not the true representation of Earth, does that mean it's automatically flat? No, it doesn't. Back towards the camera, but the Earth is down here. But his mirror is showing something else, so... Alright, moving along, you can see how the panels move, you see how the terrain kind of bends around the camera. Anybody that doesn't know, this is a this is fisheye lens. Uh, in in full effect right here okay you know what well here no no not this one not this one i'm gonna try to get it at the very last second of this video probably gonna have some stuff pop up 
you know what? I'll just take a picture right here. I'll just take a picture right here uh, of this angle. So this is what they're telling you is real. This is what they're telling you is the legit curvature of the Earth. Well, no, if it's a fisheye lens like you've just stated, then it's not the legit curvature of the Earth, is it? Right here. So let me get this quick screenshot. Okay. Now, let's pull this over here. So now I'm in QCut Pro. Uh, this is where I do my video editing. I'll make that screenshot really small. Right there. Okay, so then what you do, you just have a globe. Alright, so you take your globe, shrink that down a little bit. Bring that over here. Yeah, maybe make it a little bit bigger. Okay, so then you go back to NASA's photo. So here, I believe he's going to deliberately use an image, which by his own emission is taken with a fisheye lens and at an altitude of only 400 kilometers, and compare that image with one of the globe taken from much further away, which has to be, of course, because the whole Earth is in it. That's called being deliberately dishonest. Match that up to about where the curvature might be. And, you know, just observe what they're telling you reality is so that right there that's that's about good right there so this is what what they're telling you is real uh, from NASA so ju just viewing that okay that's about where the curvature lines up uh, this would have been the top up here yeah it's a little rough but you, you get the point yes I get your point, and it's about as credible as a promise from a politician. Here, check out this video, which I did on a Flat Earth Brothers video, who tried doing the same thing. Here is a picture of a golf ball. A golf ball has a diameter of between 41 and 42 millimetres. Now, if I place our hurricane picture on here and match up the lines, wow, my golf ball is what? 2,500 miles in diameter now? My point is this, if I'm taking a photo of something that's close up, let's say North America on the globe, North America takes up around 60% of the perceived surface. However, if I stand back and zoom in on North America, it appears much smaller in relation to the whole surface area. Here are both pictures next to each other. Try this yourself. It's a good debunk for this. Okay, obviously the curve that's being presented by NASA is just ridiculous because... No, what's ridiculous is you trying to pass this off as evidence that NASA is lying. This is what they're showing right right here. Right here. And, and this is just from one frame and you can see how the curvature on that NASA live feed, it, it changes a whole lot. Uh, in, in the process of the video as, it, as the camera shifts around. You'll see the curvature becoming wider, you'll see it becoming smaller, you'll see the panels going in and out, and just obviously, obviously it's trickery, obviously it's fake. Oh, contraire, my little flat earth friend. I put it to you that you are the one using obvious trickery. You said it yourself. The curvature changes in each frame of the video due to the lens being used. Yet you try and pick one frame and use that as NASA's definitive guide for the curvature of the earth. Trickery and fakery indeed. But the idea that they're flying 250 miles in the air at 17,500 miles per hour and showing that degree of curvature, um, yeah, that, that that's kind of a red, gun, red, red flag. Um, so just wanted to share that with you. Uh, yeah, NASA's ridiculous. And I'll, I will stand by that. Flat Earth is ridiculous, as are you and your little piece of evidence here. I will absolutely stand by that. So that's all That's all I just wanted to share with you. Going to go ahead and wrap this one up. Uh, yeah, but do these for yourself. You know, go check out these videos where they're showing curvature on, you know, whatever it is. You know, these globe believers, they want to... 
show uh, curvature on whatever uh, situation they're talking about. Just take that curvature that they're showing you, compare that to a globe and see how it pans out. Probably about as successful as your education. Right, that about wraps it up for the last video of the year. Thank you so, so much for watching. I have been Simon Dan. Please, please do like and subscribe for more of the same. Do not forget International Ballers Day on the 31st of December. I shall see you all on New Year's Day where Jason Maggard, the guy who thinks the US is half the size we're told, is back. Happy New Year.